Matthew chapter 10 is where we're starting. And if you just go to the Lord with me in prayer, Lord, I ask you this morning in Jesus' name that you'd anoint the message. You just let me convey it the way that you spoke it to me. God, the way you spoke it to my heart, let me speak it now. God, I never, ever, ever want to misrepresent you. Whether behind a pulpit or in everyday life, I don't want to misrepresent you. <clears throat> and when you have a word to speak, God, I ask that you'd speak it according to your will. and Anoint it to accomplish your work. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so we're in Matthew chapter 10. and Go to verse 28 and just hold your place there. <clears throat> Now, this is the concept of the message today, and I want you to hear me. <clears throat> it's going to sound simplistic at first. The whole crux of the message is God cares for you. Okay? It's simple, right? Not only does He care in the sense that He watches and He listens to your needs and your desires, He cares for you in a way that you cannot see. He goes before you. He prepares a path before you. He will remove stumbling blocks, if necessary, before you. He loves you when you're unlovely. Now, so you don't sweep this concept away and treat it as common and old hat. Now that you know, and I've told you that God cares for you, and you understand that, and you've known it all along. Now imagine the situation you're going through. Whatever trial, whatever difficulty, whatever problem whatever tragedy, whatever's plaguing you, whatever you're walking through in life, now apply what I said to what you're going through, that God cares for you. We are in a constant cycle of going through things and issues and trial. Why? Because God wants to purify us. He wants to change us and make us more like Him. So there will always be some catalyst in your life that is pushing you towards the cross. You know how you know if God's blessing is lifted and His touch is lifted? There's not a catalyst pushing you to the cross. There's no repentance in your life. There's no sorrow over sin. That's how you know. That's when you need to get on your knees and be like, what in the world is wrong with me? But God cares for us in the most difficult trials, even in, when it's sun shining and everybody's singing Kumbaya, my Lord, outside. It's all still, He still cares for you. And Jesus, through the Gospels, he compares and he contrasts and he uses metaphors and similes and he describes and he does all kinds of stories and he articulates this example all through the Gospel how you're cared for. And he sees you and he watches what you're enduring. He's never missed your cry, he's never missed his ear, your pain has never escaped his eye. Your groan is something He intercedes for on your behalf. And this is what got me thinking about this. The title of the sermon is Sparrows, Sheep, and Lilies. Sparrows, Sheep, and Lilies. How God compares us to things to help us understand that He cares for us. So in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, you're already there. And it says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing or a penny? And one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are numbered. Don't be afraid. You are more value than many sparrows. Now this verse is referring to itty bitty birds. When you look it up, it's, it means little sparrows. That's what, that's what it means in the Greek. Now, you may not know this, and I, I promise you, this did not influence the message at all. That's why I felt like God was speaking. But the truth is, the sparrow is my favorite bird. 
It's always been my favorite bird, even since I was little. I know you look at me and you think albatross, but really, it's sparrow. That was my favorite bird. And I loved to watch them because they were so delicate, and they were so fragile, and they're so noisy, and they're so defenseless. And I like their coloring. I just like to watch them in a tree. And, you know, something that was always stuck out to me is how fragile they were and how light they are. They're so little and obvious, and sometimes they're just oblivious to what's going on around them. Sometimes you'll have hundreds of them roost in one tree, and they're just so busy messing with each other, you can walk right by, and they, they're just oblivious to what's going on around them. And they were my favorite bird, and they still are. I like watching them. And you get a bunch of them in a tree, and they're squawking and squeaking, and they're all focused on themselves. And God says... That not one of them, not one, falls to the ground without him seeing it, without his will, and without him being there. Now I like the King James. It says not a sparrow falls to the ground without the Father. Most translations say without God's will, without the will of the Father. But the King James says without the Father. And it's powerful because it doesn't fall to the ground without him being right there, watching what's transpiring, aware of it, conscious. And he goes on, he says, you are much more valued than many sparrows. You don't scrape your knee without me being there with you, hearing, watching, seeing. They're small. In light of all my opinions and my likes about them, God's word declares that he cares for them too. And he says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny and not one of them falls to the ground without your father? And I've shared this before and I don't repeat myself because I'm forgetful or senile or unmindful. I don't do that. I don't repeat myself. The reason I repeat myself is because I want you to hear truth. I want it to stick with you. So when I repeat something, it's because I want you to retain it. And... I've said it before that it's not without the Father. It falls to the ground. I've said that before. You know, in these scriptures, they don't you lose their power just because we quote them and think of them a lot. The sparrow's defenseless and it's fragile and it tumbles to the ground, but its loving master is always with it. And you see how fatherly, motherly God compares us to a creature that's weak and defenseless and that he compares us to that thing. Sparrows are some of the, the they're, they're one of the only birds that engage in dust bathing. Instead of just water bathing, they're one of the birds that likes to throw dirt all over themselves to get clean. And I started thinking about that going, we are just like that. We're always throwing dirt all over ourselves, aren't we? We're always getting dirty. We're always going to places we shouldn't go. We're always running to thoughts we shouldn't be thinking. And it's not like we're trying to avoid the dirt. They get down in the dirt and they use their feathers to flick it all over them. And we're just like that. We go to where there's dirt. And it says that, I was reading, sparrows will actually make a hole. <laughs> How many of you have made a hole, a dirty hole, and found yourself in it? So they'll make a hole and then they'll get all the dirt on them. And God still cares for them. He still provides for them. You know, it says that he provides for the birds of the air. And I heard a pastor say one time, have you ever seen a bird in a tree just wringing its hands, wondering where the next worm's going to come from? It doesn't happen. God cares for them. He provides for them. And he goes on to say, if them, how much more us? They love to get dirty, just like you and I. But God compares us to them so that we will understand. He says, but the hairs of your head are numbered. Some of us, that's really easy to count. But others, others, you know, we have like Corey, you have a beautiful head of hair. Like me, when I'm Corey's age, I will have no hair, you know. So it'll be easier for others. But he still numbers the hairs on your head, right? He still sees them all. He still knows all your thoughts. He sees what you go through. He sees what you struggle with. And it says in his word that he cares. The implication is, if I'm with the little sparrow that possesses no soul, that has no conscience, that just goes about doing what I've programmed him to do, how much more am I with you who I created in my image? Amen. 
Think of what you're going through, what you're walking through. These words were in red. And if you're not going through anything right now, praise the Lord, but hold on tight. If you're not going through a trial, if you're not enduring something right now, praise God. Don't go tell everybody about it because they'll want to hit you. But the people that are going through something and are going through difficulty and trial, God says, I care. I see. I watch. Now sheep, sparrows, sheep, and lilies. Now I purposely, when I was reading about sheep, and I know God compares us to sheep, I didn't go to John 10. Where Jesus says, I am the shepherd. I am the true shepherd. And my sheep know my voice. And they hear my voice and they follow me. And another voice they won't follow because they hear my voice and they know my voice. I purposely didn't use that verse. I used Matthew chapter 12. And I want to tell you why. Listen to me very carefully. Because in John 10, the sheep hear. And the sheep listen. And the sheep know. And the sheep follow. But in Matthew chapter 12, all the sheep do is fall in a pit. It is not about what you do that merits God's love. The significance in John 10 is there's a response from the sheep. And that's good. We're supposed to respond. We're supposed to listen. We're supposed to follow. But when you're in his flock and you're one of his sheep, you listening, you following, you knowing his voice, that's not what makes you worthy. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? He talks about sheep, not goats. He's talking about sheep. And in Matthew chapter 12, he talks about all the sheep did to earn his care is be his And fall in a pit. To me, that's encouraging. Because when you're a sheep, he still cares for you even if you fall into a pit. Because you belong to his flock. He doesn't go just rescue the ones that were listening. Or the ones that were following. Even though we should be doing those things. So turn to Matthew chapter 12 and I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. This is something that God impressed on me. And, you know, maybe it's just a revelation for me, but I thought it was significant and powerful how in John 10, the sheep have to listen and the sheep know and the sheep follow. And then Jesus talks in Matthew chapter 12 and he says, what is there a man among you in 12, 11? In Matthew 12, 12, 12, 11, he says, what man is there among you that shall have one sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath and you don't grab a hold of it and get it out of there? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it's lawful for me to do good on the Sabbath. And he said to the man, stretch forth your hand. It was restored whole. So Jesus gives this analogy. And again, he compares us to sheep. He compares us to to sparrows. You're much better. You're worth more than sparrows. He compares us to sheep. And he doesn't say the sheep that know me, the sheep that listen to me, or the sheep that always do what they're supposed to. Those sheep, I'll pull them out of the pit. Mm -mm. He just talks about his sheep. You know, the easiest thing to compare it to is one of your children. My children don't merit me pulling them out of a pit. Did you listen today? Did you eat all the food off your plate? Did you go to bed at the right time? Then I'll pull you out of the pit. That's not how it works. That's not the father's heart. The father's heart is, it's my sheep. It's mine. They're part of my pen, my pasture, I bought them. I own them. I pull them out. And I thought it was so powerful that Jesus, he says that there was no response from the sheep. It was just part of his flock. I do. I I stress that there's promise. There's provision for those that are sheep. There's going to be a lot of goats, people. A lot. When we stand before him at the end, the majority, most, will not be good and faithful servant coming to the right enter in and then the goats will be separated to the left and there will be a lot more on the left but he's talking about sheep the sheep they're just like you and I but they're property of the shepherd there was no transaction for the sheep earning its salvation 
I'll say it again. There was no transaction between the sheep and the shepherd that the sheep earned its way out of the pit. Amen. Right? The only way the sheep was pulled out of the pit was because it was a sheep. It was bought. It was owned. It was in pasture. And that's just like you and I. Your merit, you don't come before the Father and say, save me because I've heard you. Save me because I listen. Save me because I follow. Save me because I listen to you. Save me because I'm obedient. Save me because I read a lot. Save me because I pray more than anybody else. Save me because I tithe more than anybody in that poor church. Save me. Mm -mm. The reason and the merit is you were bought with a price. You were covered with the blood of the shepherd. So he pulls you out of the pit. Isn't that great? You're, you're a sparrow that was fragile and weak and defenseless, and you're worth much more than many sparrows. You're a sheep who's defenseless and a follower who gets lost, who wanders, who follows the blind sheep in front of them and falls into a pit. But you're a sheep. I think it's so powerful that you don't have to persuade God to save you. There's no persuasion involved for God to make you whole. You don't have to persuade Him to deliver you from a situation. You don't have to bring a three-point thesis before Him and say, these are the reasons I need you to save me. And one of them is your word, and you promised, and I need to somehow have this persuasive argument and debate with God Almighty about how He needs to make me free. That's his desire from the very beginning. That's why he sent his son to die. To make you free. There's no persuasion necessary. For the son of man has come to save that which was lost. This is Matthew 18, 11. If a man had a hundred sheep and one of them went astray, won't he leave the ninety and nine and go to the mountains and seek that one that went astray? And if so be he find it, he says, truly, I say to you, he'll rejoice more over that one sheep than the 99 that didn't go astray. Even so, it's not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Not one. Now remember, they're sheep. They belong to him. He owns them. He bought them. He watches over them. He protects them. Sparrows are weak and they're small. Sheep are simple and they're followers. And sheep often wander, they're led astray. And as Jesus illustrated, they'll fall into a pit. But if we read it very clearly, it's not the will of the Father that any one of these little ones should perish. He cares. He cares. You know, he's telling you and I, I care. You won't find a deity, whether crafted and concocted by man or by falsehood and by treachery and by all kinds of hope for glory and gain, all these other religions. You don't find a God that cares other than Christianity. Amen. You don't find a God who is personal and involved, relational, that cares. You don't find a God that they refer to as Heavenly Father. Father. You protect. You guide. You provide. You deliver. You fight on my behalf. You think of me. You love me. That's the implication. Father. Some of us have had bad fathers. And it might take you a while to relearn what the Heavenly Father is like. And He's not like that earthly father. But if you read the book, you will find out all about his character that you need to know about the Heavenly Father and that he cares, especially because sheep are not goats and he goes after them. He's a true shepherd. This parable shows us through the sparrows, through the sheep that he cares for you. Have you ever fell in a figurative pit? Say yes. Yes, I have because I'm human. I did. I'm fallen. And, you know, hopefully we never will again. But, but he's always there. He's always there. You know, sometimes we're like the sparrow. 
we dug our own hole and got dirty. You know, my dad used to say, sometimes you dig a pit so deep even the up looks wrong. And sometimes that's what happens to us. And then the shepherd comes and he pulls the sheep out. He pulls you out. And then what does he do? Does he reprimand you? No. Did the shepherd take account of the time that sheep fell in the pit and put a tally mark against it? Lamb chops next time you go in the pit. No. Did the shepherd beat that sheep? Pull out that rod and staff and just beat that sheep into submission so it wouldn't go in the pit anymore? No. Did he hold that sheep's head over the pit and say, look down in there. Get a good look. Don't ever do that again. No. That's not the heart of the Father. Amen. That's not his heart. I struggle with this verse. And I don't struggle because I don't believe it. I struggle with because I can't comprehend it. That he has taken our sins <clears throat> and he has separated them as far as the east is from the west. Mm -hmm. I don't understand what that means. Because I'm not able to comprehend it. That he sees that you're a dirty little bird. You're a dirty bird. Right? He sees it. But yet he says, I've separated your sins as far as the east is from the west. And I care for you. And I'll clean you. And I'm with you. And I watch you. We have a long go way to go to comprehend the incomprehensible character of the loving God, don't we? Lilies. Now he cares for the sparrow. He cares for the sheep. He protects them. He watches over them. And he tells us about the lilies of the field. He talks about the lilies of the field. Go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. <clears throat> I'm going to read a big portion of scripture so we can get the context. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, take no thought for your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, the birds of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father, he feeds them sparrows, doesn't he? And you're much better than they. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to its stature? And why take ye thought for your clothes? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't toil, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field which is today and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, don't take thought to what you'll eat or what you'll drink or how you'll be clothed. For all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father, he knows what you have need of. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So go back to 28. And why do you take thought for clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. He's saying, the beautiful flowers that I have created and that are growing where I wanted them, they don't spend their days wringing their hands and worrying full of anxiety if they're going to be as beautiful tomorrow as they are today. Don't worry. See, those words are going to be important in the future. They're important now. It's a commandment now. It's a sin. You can be in bondage when it comes to worry and anxiety. But in the future, these verses are really going to mean something to you and I. I've preached a few messages that persecution's coming. I've talked about the fact that we are seeing the change of the age and the generation we live in right now. We're seeing a transformation in this world. The secularization, the sinfulness, the change, that it's evolving. 
And this verse is going to mean a lot to us. And we're going to live it when it says, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about where you're going to live. Don't worry about how you're going to be clothed. Because like the sparrow, like the sheep, like the flowers in the field, I will care for you. I will provide for you. I don't know what that's going to look like. Will bread fall from heaven? I don't know. He said his children will never beg bread. But he says, I care for you. He's not oblivious to our pain. He's not oblivious to our plight. He loves you. He sees you. He cares for you. He sees your trial. He watches hardship. He's not oblivious to anything you endure. He cares for you, sparrow, sheep, or lily. He watches. And there will come a time where there has been times where you have a need. And you know he cares. And the devil comes and he lies and he says, God has forsaken you. He's left you. He can't hear your cry. He can't hear your prayer. Somewhere there's a sin in your life. He's turned his back on you. He doesn't care anymore. But if you are a sheep, that is a lie. He watches. He's there. He is right beside you. Hears. Cares. Provides. We will stand on this verse like we never have before in the future. If the Lord tarries and we're in this planet, I don't even want to give it a figure. I don't even know the year. I, I'm just guessing of what I feel and what I think in the next 10, 20 years. It'll be ugly. And there will be <clears throat> more mocking, more laws made. I won't be able to stand up here or Maybe they'll take me away. You think that's far-fetched? Go to Scotland. Go to Canada. Try to say some of the stuff I say from this pulpit and find out what happens. Fine you. Jail you. I'm not saying that out of pride. I'm, I don't want to go to jail. I don't want... Hear me. I don't want to be persecuted. I don't want to be tortured. But we know that's what's coming. And we know that we don't have to worry. He said, don't worry. Don't worry about it. I got it. I care for you. The, your homework, you go try and find a bird that's wringing his hand, wondering where the next worm's coming from. You go try to wipe the sweat off of a, flare, a flower's brow out there that's trying to grow. No. No. They're exactly where they're supposed to be, doing what they're supposed to be. When you're a sheep and you're in that fold, you're in that place. You know, I want to be careful that I don't lead you astray by the context of what I'm saying. I'm not talking about goats. I'm talking about sheep that were covered with blood, that are in the right pasture. <clears throat> goats don't get that kind of provision. Goats don't get that. You have to be a sheep. Goats are outside the pen where there's wolves and lions and tigers and bears. Right? But the point of what I feel like the Lord was saying today and this morning and last night was that he, you need to tell them that I still care for them. No matter what you're going through. Sometimes I feel like I want to name issues or name struggles or name certain problems some of us go through, whether it be issues of the heart or relational issues. and I don't want to name them because I don't want you to think that this word was written for you. It was written for all of you. There is nothing that escapes him. And there is nothing that he can't help and that he doesn't want to bring about to glorify himself.